films Operation Avalanche and The Dirties. He is the film's co-writer, director, he stars in the role of Doug, he probably did craft services. Please welcome Matt Johnson. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Congratulations. Why are you talking? So, you know, I, I'm, I'm very used to this because I've screened this movie basically nonstop since uh, February, since we premiered in Berlin. And I have noticed a very common refrain, which is that as soon as I show up for the Q&A and people see how ridiculous I look in real life, they start laughing and they go, oh, I see what he's done. It's a lot better that it's a bit when people laugh, then when people are like, hmm, oh, why did you come in costume? Which I heard all the time when I was in Europe, all the time. That people thought I was dressed like my character, and I was like, you know, I got to control what the character wore. I was in charge of the movie. And because I was directing it, I thought, oh, this will be a lot quicker if he's just dressed like me. Um, because on a movie, you, you waste so much time in wardrobe. And uh, this is, I mean, not to say that wardrobe's not important, but, but uh, I did not want to be one of the actors who was uh, milking it in my trailer. And so I just got to show it. So I'm really killing somebody. <laughs> well, I'll be honest, until I saw you in person, I assumed it was a wig. In that I was wearing a wig, yes. yeah, you know. I'm yeah. still convinced. <laughs> well, you know, come, come see me after the show, you can pull on this and see what happens. Um, no, you know, I had a vision. There's a, a book I was reading concurrently with with this one. This is based on a, a book of, like a journalist wrote a book, um, two journalists, and uh, it was about the facts of the, of the case, except because it was uh, made with the approval of both Jim Balsley and Mike Lazaridis, it didn't actually get into much of the gritty dirt. Um, and it also didn't explain a lot of the culture. And so at the same time, I was reading a book about a video game team from the 90s that designed the first first-person shooter, a book called Masters of Doom, mm -hmm. which is an unbelievable book about about uh, John Carmack and John Romero, and I noticed this guy, John Romero's hair was so crazy, and I was like, oh, there's something about like grungy hacker 90s aesthetic that I think I could bring into this Blackberry world, and yeah. so that's why my hair is like this. I, I'm just keeping it long because I, we're still doing reshoots for it. There's still some things that I want to change, and so. It comes just, out next week. Yes, I know, but I still have time. Okay. It's Friday, right? <laughs> I think there's my distributor here. I, when I screened the movie in Berlin, my editor and I were looking, watching it, and uh, and he's here actually. Bobby's just over there. We're watching it. And we're like, ah, oh, feels a little long, doesn't it? Okay. And so we recut the movie for South by, screened it. Again, we were like, hmm, it might still be too long. And I'm sure many of you were thinking, you could have kept going. <laughs> but uh, but as a, you run out of time. Yeah. That's so interesting because I did see reviews had different run times. Yeah. It was originally two hours and four minutes. I'm like, no, it's not. No, yeah, I learned this from Ruben Osland because he did this with his film Play yeah. at, at Cannes. There's a famous story where he was sitting behind a critic at the world premiere of the movie, and if you've ever seen Play, it's a masterpiece film, like, it's a must-watch, but uh, Ruben describes the critic in front of him going like this, <laughs> and then the scene would keep going, and then the next scene, because they're all singles, and the next scene would go, <laughs> like this, and he just paid attention, and was like, okay, I'm going to make those cuts. <laughs> amazing that he had that power. <laughs> the critic, I mean. Well, you know, you have no idea really? what a director's ego will feel like. If you get him in the right moment, you can basically have final cut on his film. <laughs> <laughs> you just catch, him at, uh, catch a director at their weakest, and you will exert outsized control over the finished product. That's good, because I have some casting notes. Please. Where I think you should know. Please. <laughs> no, I only, I only mention that because, first of all, Glenn Howerton is so good in this movie. I know. Um, but when I saw the poster, I thought he was Ray Fiennes. Really? Yes. And then when I realized it was Glenn, I was like doubly blown away because he's, he's just so fantastic. Well, he, I got to tell you, I think a lot of people, if you're familiar with him from his television series, I think, well, one, already clearly a lot of people are, are, are really reacting to this performance. But more than that, the seriousness that he brought, not just to the role, but to his impact on the set, it's, it's hard to, this is a very small movie, it's a very small Canadian movie, and to have somebody like Glenn show up 
on our little tiny so we shot almost entirely on on location and then to have him walk into the room and bring the gravity that he did really did set the tone of those 90s sequences in a major way like he was not he gave us the dignity of of being the adult in the room and he didn't drop it and that let us kind of in character not fear him but feel like okay we need to like live up to this and and because all of the the people that you're watching in that little gang of engineers those are all just like punk filmmakers from toronto like none of these are actors these are just my friends some of them are students and they're all like indie filmmakers from the city and and so and we had no idea what we're doing they, like they, they don't have lines there's no script like they're just we're just trying to because i was trying to create like the feeling of of that I remembered about the 90s in these in these like video game land party engineering situations and it was like very like relaxed and and to do that I knew we couldn't write anything and then to combine that with somebody like Glenn who would come in with no sense of humor about what was going on yeah and be like no no I really expect you to do these things it created a kind of magic for us because it gave us something incredible to bounce off and to be truly scared of He's such a gifted comedic actor. What made you think of him for this part? I, I only wanted to work with comedians, mostly because I hate doing rehearsals, because I feel like what always happens to me when I'm rehearsing something is something amazing will happen in the rehearsal, and then we'll be chasing it. We're chasing it on the day, and I knew that if I only cast comedians, they would appreciate the idea that we were going to discover the energy on the, in the moment, on the day, and that... And, and we prepared for that. That's why we shot with these long zoom lenses and why we would shoot scenes all the way through. It's because we didn't know what was going to happen inside the scene. And especially since I'm in a lot of these scenes, I wanted Jared, the cinematographer, to be able to react to what was going on and decide, okay, this is a close-up. Okay, this, this like the energy is, is, is at a medium. We can keep this wide. And so we're only doing four or five takes of these scenes with no rehearsal and comedians just i mean you probably have experienced it too they have a way of turning it on yeah. you know they have a way of just being like okay i'm on okay i'm on but they can't do that all the time and there's only a certain amount of energy for that and and both glenn and jay just well they just had that perfectly i really think these are career best performances for both glenn and jay they're they're so fantastic um not only as a director but as their scene partner for many of these scenes what's it like to be in the room with them it was a lot of fun and, and really high stakes. I think people say, oh wow, it looks like you guys had a lot of fun making this, this movie. 10% of the time. But 90%, it was quite like, it was pretty serious. We did not have a lot of time, we did not have a lot of money, and we're kind of whipping through this stuff. And to your point of, of me being in the scenes with them, I think one of the biggest, most unlikely pieces of luck that I got was that I'm the director of the film, so really I am kind of the boss of everything. And it means that people need to listen to me, etc. I mean, I'm, this is almost tautological, like obviously this is true, but because the character I'm playing is the lowest status person in the movie, and I'm constantly dipping into that reality whenever we say action, it really helped to create a kind of easy, communicative, like, no, I didn't feel like I was overbearing, and I could really give honest feedback yeah. to everybody without without them because in, as soon as in two seconds they were going to be way above me again right so it was okay for me to really be quick and really be honest and say look this really wasn't working we've got to go to this and and be very direct whereas i think that i wouldn't have had the confidence to do that if they weren't going to in an imaginary world become my superior and i was going to be really uh, supplicative to them mm -hmm. soon. So I, I found that to be very useful. I think just for me psychologically, I, I wonder if you talk to them if they would say something similar. Oh, uh, they'd, actually, they'd say they loved you if you said this was their career best performance. <laughs> they loved you in that. Uh, something I really love about this film is I, I don't know anything about tech, nor do I fully understand like sort of the back door wheelings and dealings that go on. And yet this movie is so entertaining and horrifying on equal levels. Um, how did you go about making it so accessible to everyone? You and I are the same in this way. I mean it, and it's that I think that because I also was completely ignorant to these things. I didn't make this movie because I had an interest in Blackberries, or because I had an interest in telecommunication or even technology. I know 
I mean, I'm, I'm a, I have a degree in film. <laughs> okay. Like, I guess. <laughs> Not my school. Um, but I have a degree in film. Okay. Like, technical? I guess. <laughs> Not my school. And, um, and I think it was that very fact. I'll put it this way. If you were to have to make this movie, I think that you needing to try to figure it out in your beginner's mindset, the same way that I did, actually has the key to then how to explain it to an audience. Because I needed to figure it out coming from a complete neophyte's point of view, and that reduced everything to a kind of digestible, understandable vernacular. Um, and so I just tried to get it to a place where I kind of vaguely understood what was going on, and then, and then wrote it like that. And, and the fact is, I mean, Bobby knows, like, a lot of those technical scenes are way, way longer. Like, we, they, we way overshot them, and we had, um, like, a lot more technical language, because I didn't want to, I didn't want to fake it, like, I didn't want to have, like, uh, like, things in there that just openly didn't make sense, and so I overwrote them all, and then in the edit, we just kept it to the absolute, absolute minimum. And it's why we shot everything to camera, so that we could seamlessly just take sections of the, of the movie out if we needed to. But I actually owned a BlackBerry. I understand you never actually had one. I never touched one before we started shooting. Yeah, <laughs> I, 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 um, I, well, I, I, I don't know. Like there was nothing appealing about it to me when I was a kid, and then when I was on set, and to be totally honest, when, when uh, Adam Belanger, the art director, handed this to me, it was like, okay, you better learn how to type on one of these. I held it and I was like, how, how did this even catch on? Like, <laughs> it, I found it so difficult to type, like unbelievably so. But thank God. Jay Baruchel, in real life, had been a die-hard BlackBerry user until 2020. Oh. <laughs> did not get I did not get a smartphone until 2020, and so every single time you see somebody typing in the movie, it was, it's his hands because he was the only person in. he could type like fire. He was he was incredible. We were watching him type, and we're like, well, thank God, you look like the guy who invented this thing because. <laughs> It was it was like on one of those competitions. He could he could type faster on a BlackBerry than he could on a keyboard. I, no, I believe I. It's funny. If you, I think it's I think it's his character. He even says in the movie like, "Who just wants a phone that's a big screen?" I miss that keyboard. I do. Justice for BlackBerry. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know what's funny? I, I I it's it's a strange time culturally because it seems like a lot of people are trying to get back to a more limited piece of technology, and it, it, I would never have thought that I would all of a sudden be um, attracting so much um, feedback from people who think that I'm a uh, maven now for minimum tech because I made this movie. But so many people give me the same refrain of, oh my god, I wish I had a phone that was just a keyboard, texting and email, and that's it. Like, I love this product. And it makes me think, oh wow, isn't it ironic that maybe BlackBerry could have thrived if rather than going above Apple, they actually tried to go under them. And they said, you know what, let's not go anywhere near, we're not gonna make Blackberry Storm. Like if in that pitch with Verizon, Mike had said, my iPhone killer is we're going to take all the features that we built in Blackberry for the last six years, and we're gonna take them away. And we're gonna go back to what we had in like 1996, 1997. And I actually think that the product would still exist. Oh, wow. I, it's funny because I've been talking about this movie a lot with people lately because people are really excited about it. They, they, they're they aware of it. And the way that I've sort of described it is, you know, you know how beta was actually better than VHS? Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> and people instantly know what I mean. And I this, this made me very nostalgic for that. Although I, you don't want to be that one person in your group chat that is like the green bubble That's when okay. everyone else is blue. It's, yeah. well, but you want to, but funny, BlackBerry invented that. What? That <laughs> cliquey texting was invented. You see it in the movie. The BBM network was the very first texting clique, and you would be like, give me your BBM pin, give me your BBM pin, and I remember, I'm a kid hearing that, and I'm like, I have no idea what that means. I'm still texting T9, and I have no idea what that is, so, but BlackBerry is, it's funny, man, BlackBerry invented so much stuff. You got a group of young engineers, and which was at first tens, then hundreds, then thousands, and then a hundred thousand, and that think tank winds up creating so much stuff. When you double space on your phone and it creates a period, they have the patent on that. When you type in a, a name and it auto-completes in an email, they invented that. Like they invented so much UI general stuff because they had the hardware and they needed to figure out how to make it work that the list of things that we just kind of take for granted in terms of how we use these smart devices, it's crazy. It's crazy. 
And why don't you hit upon the idea of, of telling it specifically in these three different time periods? Because I just, I love, so I, one of my least favorite ways to do a true story is to take us through every single step. It's horrible. Every single year. Yeah, I yes. agree with you completely. And, and that is a big part of it. Mostly, look, the secret to, to, to why you would want to make this movie in the first place is because I wanted an opportunity to work with great actors and show them doing awesome shit. And I knew that if the movie was about everything, it would be about the product and not the people. And so I picked moments where I felt like these guys were at their most stressed, were making their biggest decision points, and then I took out all the stuff of them celebrating or in the boom time or like when they're, like, like things that I thought would be more about BlackBerry as a device were not interesting to me, um, which, is, which is how, um, we settled on these three moments mm -hmm. because it just seemed like the times where, where these guys were one of their most interesting, but also making decisions that would change the rest of their life. So it, it came through that, basically through what I didn't want to show, which is I wanted to have as little footage of people using and talking about Blackberries as possible. Which is, which is ironic because <laughs> obviously the movie is called Blackberry and you think it is going to be a star, but that's a, yeah, it's a marketing gimmick. You're also, <laughs> you mentioned that, uh, you know, you're working on an independent budget, but this is a period piece. It's not just a period piece, it's three period yeah. pieces. You have a pretty sprawling ensemble. Uh, what was the biggest challenge for you as a filmmaker? Yeah. It's funny, I should have an answer to that, eh? Because I get, I mean, the biggest challenge when you make a movie, I'm sure if any of you guys have been in this situation, is like trying to feel that thing you felt when you first thought of the movie when you're on set and everything's going wrong and you missed all these shots and the actors don't like you and then the actors hate you shortly after and you're like what why am i doing this and to somehow recall that initial spark of oh wait like there's something that i loved about this at some point and and the distance that i would get from that moment that was the hardest um but if you have a good team around you, which I do, I mean, I work with all of my friends exclusively, like in Toronto, it's a very small group of people working with very little money. And that, in my opinion, actually makes it a lot easier because I'm not in a big machine and so I can't really show up with a bad attitude. Do you know, because how, how, how rude of me or how insensitive or I, like, because then I'm showing up being like, oh, hey, all my best friends, I'm a prick today. Like it just doesn't it doesn't work. Whereas if I was in a crew with all strangers, then I could, you know, escape into my ego and, and be a real diva. But um, so I think I was saved from the real pain of what uh, of what <laughs> who is that? <laughs> who is this? It's a plant. It's a plant. <laughs> to talk to or spend any time with any of the people that are portrayed in the, the real people no i get asked this a lot and i've got yeah. an interesting uh, take on it one i none of us wanted to meet them glenn jay none of us we had no interest because we had a vision of, <laughs> of what we wanted to do and i think it was the canadian in me where i was like you know if i meet this guy doug and i like fall in love with him like i'm gonna have trouble going all out when I'm acting, I'm not going to want to act like a total baby. You know what I mean? I have to do some pretty insouciant stuff in the film, and and if I know him, I'll I, I'll feel bad about that. And and maybe Glenn might not admit it, but he feels the same. Um, and so we really stayed away from them. But then the most insane thing happened, which is that about two weeks ago, in Toronto, we did the Canadian premiere of the film. Okay, huge, huge cinema, our biggest. The the Toronto Film Festival owns a theater, and they they put us in their big cinema. And it's a big, like, public event, okay? All the politicians and everything there. Who shows up? Jim Balsall. Oh, my God. <laughs> okay? And he's dressed to the nines. <laughs> and I'm telling you, this guy is jacked. He's, he's fucking huge. I mean, I mean, like, he's huge. And he's, like, 65 years old, looks like a WWF wrestler. I'm, he, I'm sure he's on gear. And he's standing next to Glenn, who I think is a pretty big guy, very fit guy, okay? And he's like, Glenn looks like he's like a prepubescent next to, next to Jim. And he comes backstage and he's chatting with us. He's pretty laconic, like he's just saying, hey, how you doing? 
oh yeah, I'm excited about the movie, whatever. We're all shaking hands. He walks the red carpet with us. The press is going insane. Like, they can't believe they're getting photographs of this. He sits in the theater, they turn it on, and I, like, run, I leave. I'm like, I can't sit here for this. The whole audience knows he's there, everybody's afraid. Okay, I get the report afterwards from my producer, Matt Miller, who stayed. He said, it was dead quiet for the first 15 minutes. Everybody was so scared. Then, Glenn did something, I don't remember what, he swore. Jim laughs so loud, the whole audience starts laughing, and then it's just a laugh riot, the whole movie. Nobody laughing harder than Jim. And at the end, Jim was like, yeah! <laughs> so it was a, I, I, I liken it to a psychedelic experience for that audience. So that, but other than that, there's been no, no contact. I mean, I actually, I really love Doug, so yes, he does. He first, he's right, first of all. I agree, I agree. Yeah. And, I, and he's the only character that really doesn't change at all. He sticks to his principles and is proud of them. But I like to pair that with the idea that on his own, I don't think he would have achieved much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he would have. Yeah, and he would have been a fun guy to hang out with, but yeah. Yeah, I actually, I, I feel like they would be flattered by these portrayals, but maybe it's, I'm sure it's a weird thing. You, you never know. Yeah. What, 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 I did get to speak with Jim briefly, and the only thing he said, so a couple of things that were crazy. He was like, how did you know I'd never seen Star Wars? And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> this is crazy. This is crazy. And then he said, you know, I was actually a lot funnier than that. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, that, that tracks. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. Well, both of them, I thought, Man, uh, yeah. Anyway, I won't say anything because he because he really won the night. It, it's a very interesting thing in my life. I got to witness that a movie where I thought a guy was going to come and really maybe have a bad attitude or be insulted or or who knows, right? I mean, you see a movie about yourself. He's a Titanic citizen in my country. Like he really is like one of the biggest public facing businessmen who's ever lived in Canada, and he was so gracious yeah. and he was so kind and. Everybody walked away being like, no, oh, well, Jim's not so bad. <laughs> what, what kind of nice guy? But then somebody said, you know, he might be very wise, and this is like a public rehabilitation. Like, he may be leaning into this, trying to sanitize his image. Either way, I, it's all good with me. <laughs> I actually do want to take some questions from the audience. If you have any, feel free to raise your hand. We'll start right here in front. Um, great, so, uh, you said you didn't have much time. I'm curious, how much time did you have, and what was how much time did you have, and what was the secret to making your schedule? We, we shot. We had. We had more like days than you think. We shot the movie in thirty-four days. Um, but bear in mind what you're what, what you're watching is a very pared-down version of what the movie used to be. It used to be three and a half hours long. So I I made I made some mistakes. I made some mistakes. And uh, and and we we wrote it quite long. But we did that because I knew that we weren't gonna keep everything and uh, and I work with a team and my producers like they follow that philosophy as well. Um, but the way that we stayed fast is this and this is what I've been doing my whole career and I hope I don't ever have to, ever have to stop is our approach to coverage, which is to say like, you, like they're often moving the camera into close-ups and they gotta change the lighting and everything, is that we, because we're shooting it kind of like a fake documentary, our big influence was a D.A. Penny Baker movie called The War Room uh, about the Clinton election in 1992, and we wanted to shoot the whole movie like that. And what that meant was that we tried to find a way where we could set both cameras up in a single place where they just need to pivot a little bit, and then we'd shoot all of our coverage out of the entire scene just from those two camera positions and change the lensing and slightly move the camera as we went. So we could just shoot the entire take all the way through four, sometimes five times, and then we'd be done. Whereas if we were trying to shoot like that diner scene's a good example, when Jim first comes in and we're all talking to one another, if you were trying to shoot that in standard coverage, that would be like, it would take a long time just to match the performance and get what you want, et cetera, et cetera. But we just said, one on me and Jay, and then one on Jim, and then just roll. And we did it five times, and we're done. And then we just move on. Thank you for not releasing the three-hour cuts. No, it would have been painful. It would have been painful. Yeah. <laughs> we have one right there in the middle. Yeah. Hi, Matt. First of all, uh, you know, this is an incredible movie, and you're so super funny in the movie. We <laughs> love you. Uh, My question is, uh, 
uh, Doug is secretly so rich. How rich is he? Do you he know? He's a billionaire. Idea? Hardcore. Wow. Yeah, and, and I'll tell you how Doug did it. He was a founding uh, member of the company, so him and Mike started the company together, those two guys. And he just sort of modestly worked there until, I mean, the story follows it pretty clearly. He was like, oh, the culture's changing here. They don't need me anymore. My best friend, like, really doesn't need me at all. And so it wasn't out of spite or anything. He was just like, oh, I'm going to go do something else. And so he left and sold his stock and was thinking, well, they're probably going to go on to make a lot more money, but I'll leave now. And the stock went from $237 a share to two. Wow. Yeah, and right now it's trading at five. That's Canadian, so it's like less than one. Uh, so, so yeah, he made out like a bandit, but uh, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't want to try to mythologize it more than the movie already does. Um, but it is interesting. Is he it? richer than Elon Musk? That's what I want. Not even close. <laughs> Not even close. But probably richer than, than Jim. Uh, you know what's funny? Jim is such a magnate, mm -hmm. and him and Mike are so hooked up in like the Bay Street Canadian like venture capital scene that I actually think that they made a lot of money post hoc. Really? I think they took the money that they did make and invested it very shrewdly in a lot of venture cap stuff mm -hmm. and I think they made a ton of money. Well, look, whatever this guy is on is not cheap. Yeah. <laughs> just so long. yeah. Like he looks like he's about 46. Yeah. No wonder you can have a good attitude about the movie. He avoided prison. Oh yeah, I know. Yeah. He's living the life. You know, I have a great quote from, uh, I won't say who said it, but after the screening, somebody came up to me who knew Jim well, and he grabbed my hand and said, he'll never tell you, but you got everything right. And I went, who are you? And he said, I work closely with him. He came up to, and, I, and he said, I'm going to tell you a story. And you remember that final moment between him and Mike? where Mike fires him basically and fucks his life over and, and you're expecting Glenn to just lose his shit and basically murder Mike, that's what I'm thinking. And that's kind of what I, where I thought the scene might go. Yeah. And Glenn does this brilliant thing in this single where he just kind of thinks about it, hmm, and then he smiles and then thinks about what he's going to do next and then goes, okay, so where did you say they were again? Oh, they're next door, okay, I'm, I'll, okay, basically see you later, Mike, and leaves. And that moment, it's almost as though, well, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know what was going in Glenn's head, but what this guy says to me is that after all this stuff happened with the SEC and Jim basically lost his life, I had lunch with him and I'd never seen him happier. And I was like, what? And I said to him after 90 minutes, and normally his secretary would call him every 25 minutes to get him out of whatever he was doing. It was like a ritual, something we didn't put in the film because we, we, he never had any long meetings. And... The phone kept going off and Jim was ignoring it. And this guy at the end of the meeting said, Jim, what is going on? Like, I've never seen you like this. You seem like you're ecstatic. And he said, I don't know. I guess it took losing everything for me to realize what a big shot I was. And it's so funny how you make a movie and you try to follow these themes of a man you don't know, just based on behavior, things that you kind of extract from a book where you're trying to find the myth. And then hearing a story like that just a, a week or 10 days ago or something like that really moved me and i thought oh did glenn somehow get this right just by feeling and embodying this character and uh yeah so anyway don't share that story i'm, I'm not sure if, if, uh, <laughs> if uh if the real jim wants people to know that but yeah it stayed with me wow that's incredible yeah we have time for i think one more it yes you're right there um, in your previous films, it was you starring and you can bring like recognizable actors, and so you said you made this film wanting to do that for a change, and so I'm wondering uh, what surprised you about that experience. Mm. The question is about all, all my films, first of all, are all it, it, extremely low budget, like like sub one million, like nothing, like and I'm, and they're completely improvised as well. There's no script, um, and so the question is, what was the difference doing something like this with a real with a real cast? So the thing I one of the major things I wasn't prepared for is that actors really do like the comfort of knowing what they're supposed to say and when, and I wasn't prepared for that. And this is in no way. Uh, uh, like a slight against 
actors not wanting to just come up with stuff, but the, the environment that I'm used to is everybody just write, says what they want, write your own dialogue, like, and we'll figure it out later. And that was the exact opposite of what the cast wanted to do. And that was all across the board. Everybody wanted to, because I think they all liked the script, and, and I was thinking that the script was just like a starting mm -hmm. point. Like, I thought it was just going to be our base layer, and then we were going to kind of figure out the movie on set, and that was a real surprise. For me that oh no it was like these guys had read the script they memorized the script and they came with ideas about the words that were on the page and and that was gratifying to me i think maybe i was a bit too um hard on myself to at first accept that people would want to to be so close to the text um and so me trying to get away from it might have been me being like no 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 it, like i just wrote it like as a joke, like please don't take it that seriously. Um, but but as I kind of gave into it, I, I I learned myself an appreciation of like finding the mystery in the words, and instead of improvising and finding play by creating whatever I wanted, it would be finding play in what was already there, and and I really came to enjoy that um, a lot. But, and, but which obviously, this, any actor who's hearing me say this is like, yes, idiot, what do you think we're all doing? <laughs> but. Uh, but I found that very challenging, and then also just dealing with with multiple personalities. Like it, it, it's so different than than uh, than making things just on your own with your friends. But it, 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 what I say is that directing, a lot of people don't realize, is, is so much closer to sports team coaching than it is to art. Um, you you are managing it, it, like so many different people's emotion and trying to get them all to the same place. And and for me anyway. It, that meant that about 50% of my time was spent getting a, a, a sense of where everybody was at and trying to bring them to the same place. And, and that really had nothing to do with the filmmaking process. Um, and so that was a big shock. But well, one that I came to really love. But the first five days were pretty nasty, I'll tell you. <laughs> the first five days were rough. Like, I was not, I was like, yeah, yeah. You just seem surprised that they liked the script they said yes to. Yeah, again, but that, that is my own ignorance, and also my own, um, again, I keep bringing it back to a Canadian, like, like oh, yeah, self-deprecation, like, I, I, can't, I can't tell you how my friends and I, every step of the way, we felt like we were getting away with something, you know, we were like, oh, wow, playing like this script, he thought it was good, oh, my God, I can't believe we fooled this guy, it's amazing, I think he's coming to Toronto, I think he's getting on the plane, no, he's actually coming, this is crazy, maybe he didn't read the script, and like an assistant who didn't know anything about scripts told him it was good, oh, man, we better write a script before he gets here, <laughs> It's like that that was more or less the energy until we were about in day 10 and we were like, oh no, we actually are making this movie. <laughs> it's such a great movie and it's going to be in theaters. Uh, this Friday, yeah. Friday, yeah. yeah. Please spread the word. Thank you so much for Oh, thank you. This is so, so wonderful. Thank you. I mean, great having you. Thanks a lot. Thanks for coming. If you have any more questions, let me around. Um, and good night. <laughs>